What are the risks involved in building an app? And what are the things that could go wrong versus the things that more likely will go wrong? Hello and welcome. My name is Dale Richards, CEO of App Creative, an app development company on the Silicon Slopes of Utah. We're on a mission to build apps to change the world. If you want to build apps, grow your SaaS business, and make money doing cool software entrepreneur related stuff, start now by subscribing and hitting the bell. As a software entrepreneur, you're standing in front of this big ocean that you need to cross, and you don't really know what you're going to face or what's in store for you during this journey. So let's go over some of the things that, that could go wrong. And these are the things that software entrepreneurs are afraid will happen. Uh, and then after that, let's touch on things that are more likely to happen. Because what could happen is very different from what likely will happen. Hopefully by the end, you'll feel a little bit more confident about the journey. So imagine the extreme. Here are two major concerns that I hear from prospective clients all of the time. So uh, the first one is that the vendor is going to just come and steal all of your money. And this probably won't happen. Uh, I haven't run into any offshore software vendors that were just waiting for that initial wire transfer and then they just made off with the client funds. That's more of a scenario that you'd find like, you know, in your spam folder from a Nigerian prince. Plus, uh, when, when wiring money abroad, most American banks will require you to receive the services you pay for before sending the funds. Uh, so you likely won't be able to send money abroad until you actually receive the work. Uh, sending a deposit to an American company, though, is commonplace uh, and usually pretty safe since you have a, a contract that is governed by American law. So the other concern is that your vendor is going to steal your intellectual property and make an app from your idea and then hit it big beating you to the market. But, but don't worry, an NDA is going to cover that, right? Right? So also, this is very unlikely. If, if someone were to steal your intellectual property, they likely wouldn't have the industry background that you have. They wouldn't be able to bring a product to market based upon your know-how and expertise. After all, you're the one that's been working on this app concept. You've been validating it. You've been testing the ideas with target users. You're the one that feels passionate about this specific mission. Also, software vendors aren't looking to become SaaS product owners. Like they simply just don't have the interest or the ability to market a product like yours and make it successful. You bring the rocket fuel, they're just building the rocket. And they're like engineers who aren't interested in going to space. They just want to build stuff and get paid. So for them to steal your idea would mean significant risk of their own resources. They're like, they're not, they're just not interested in that kind of risk. So shifting away from these extremes that could happen, uh, let's talk about some things that are actually more likely to happen. Uh, one is you lose a developer. Uh, this happens all the time. You know, a developer quits, gets sick, or simply loses interest and disappears, especially if you're working with a solo freelancer. It's not much of an issue if you're working with an agency because the agency is responsible to keep developers engaged. When you lose a developer, it can put your project behind schedule, which may be a source of headache and stress for some time. Uh, and once you find another developer to fill in, it's going to take some time to get that person up to speed. So that's one thing. You can lose a developer. Uh, here's another thing. Uh, your vendor misquotes or underestimates your cost. So they did poor due diligence or they underprojected the requirements that you gave them. As a result, the time and the manpower that it takes to finish your app comes out to be more than initially expected. And as a result, the price will increase and potentially skyrocket for all the overtime and additions that your app requires. Chances are the vendor isn't necessarily being malicious. They probably just don't have a good process for estimation or uh, they have a disconnect between sales and delivery. After all, estimating software development can be very hard. I know <laughs> you don't necessarily need to have someone with a perfect track record or estimation process. You just need someone who will treat you fairly and keep their promises. So another thing that could happen is that your vendor like renders services to you, services in quotes, uh, that they achieve the same outcomes, but they aren't necessarily what you paid for. So for example, you might be paying for DevOps services. And normally this refers to the building of deployment pipelines that your developers can use to deploy code from a development environment to a test environment and ultimately to your end users. What the vendor is really doing is just having someone deploy your code manually without all the automation and, and billing you for these, these automated DevOps processes. Uh, it's kind of a lot of mumbo jumbo, but basically they're kind of pretending that they're giving you one service when really they're giving you a really simple basic service that doesn't really like, doesn't really like lay the foundation for your future. Now this could be partly because not everyone in this scenario understands what DevOps really means. So they might think that they're being honest with you, but what's really going on is that either you're paying for automation that you're not getting, 
or you're paying for someone, the vendor calls DevOps, but they're really just a release manager. If all this DevOps stuff is confusing to you, read DevOps for Entrepreneurs to learn more. We'll put a link in the description below. Uh, another thing that can happen is that you add more and more features. So uh, that's a risk that you can control because you're the one that is asking for stuff. Uh, you think that your app needs this and this and that, and before you know it, the app is barely within the budget and now you're, you're caught in a tight space. And the best thing that you can do in this situation is to ask yourself, do you really need that stuff? Do you really need to have those features for your MVP release? Chances are you can probably get by without them. Uh, if you keep adding features, your timeline is going to get longer and your cost is going to increase. A good thing that you can do to mitigate this risk is to work with a company who can be your partner and provide product management <laughs> services to help guide your decisions on what's in versus what's out. A lot of companies will just take your order and build whatever you say. And after all, like, they're financially incentivized to build more stuff. So you want to work with a vendor that will say, you know, you don't really need this and here's why. And then they can explain it to you. So a vendor that will turn away from added scope to help you do the right thing for your product is the vendor that you want. Another thing that's more likely to happen is that you build features that your users don't need. Sometimes you'll have a great idea to build a certain feature only to find out that your users don't really use it or, or even want it. This is where it's important to tell the difference between your own ideas and feelings and what you, and what you validated with your target users. Basing features off of your value proposition is a good first step to mitigating this risk. Also, validating concepts within your target users while the features are still in design can help avoid spending money on features you don't need. So you wanna to try to kill those features that you don't need early on in the design process. So some real challenges in mobile app development. All of the things that we've just listed uh, could happen, uh, but it might be more helpful for you to hear about some of the real experiences that we did have either on our own apps or projects or working with clients. So here are a few incidents that come to mind. Uh, with one client, we found that in order to develop the app, we would need a third party license that was very expensive. It was a license that the client wasn't willing to pay for, but having it would solve a lot of problems that, that we faced while we were building this thing out. So instead we were told to find a different way to solve the problem. And we ended up spending like three weeks trying to solve this issue without success. After discussing the situation with the client, we were eventually able to agree to a workaround, but it felt like we were being asked to fly to the moon without any rocket fuel. And we lost time and money as a result. So that's the thing that actually did happen. Uh, on a different project with a client, they wanted to support different languages. Uh, after agreeing to, to do this, we were almost blindsided by the amount of complexity the increased languages caused with the app's workflow. So the release of the beta app was delayed a month uh, as other issues were encountered and testing the app was delayed and took longer than expected. We wanted to make sure that the app was you know, functioning smoothly in the different languages. So it, it took some additional time to kind of work through that complexity, but it was, it was pretty intense. On another project, we built something that went against the uh, Apple App Store's terms and conditions. And we built a product for a client that created a credit or a token model for consuming experiences in the app. And at that time, it broke Apple's rules and we couldn't launch via the App Store. So we had to come up with workarounds, none of which the client really liked. And in the end, we had to kind of put that mobile portion on hold and focus on the client's web portal. Since that time, Apple actually has changed their terms of service. So you'll want to become really familiar with the Apple App Store terms of service and the Google Play terms and conditions and keep current with those changes. Uh, early on in our history, uh, we made the wrong decision about hybrid versus native. Uh, fortunately, it was our own app and not a client product, so we didn't put anyone else's money at risk. Previously in my career, I led the product strategy on a really cool mobile app, and the developers working on it constantly complained that it was a web hybrid app and not a native app. And so they referenced the app's speed and performance, as well as things that we couldn't do because we didn't have access to the native features of the device. So coming out of this, I was determined to avoid these problems. And I told myself that we would prove out our MVP on iOS and then follow up with the native Android version later. So we went with iOS native. And yes, the app ran smoothly and didn't have those performance challenges that the other app had. But then when I, when I shopped the app around and took it to sell it to clients, the, the clients asked, so is there an Android version of this app? And I had to tell them no. And it was a huge barrier to them adopting our app and it blocked our cash flow since people wouldn't buy. So now again, this is very early on in the history of our company and we have since built lots of great products, but at, at the time it was a devastating blow. You know, so if you're building an MVP, 
use a hybrid technology so that you can build your app once and launch it to both Apple and Android devices. For more information, check out our article about native versus hybrid technologies. So there's a quick overview of app development risks, including what could happen when risks became actual issues. Uh, so we talked about what could happen, what will likely happen, and also a few of the things that did happen to us. Risks have been and always will be a part of the journey, especially so when it comes to expanding your horizons and learning new things. So here's wishing you the best on your journey. And if you have any other questions for navigating this ocean, check out some of our other articles and videos somewhere around here. We'll see you next time.